We turned water on at the new church building this week, and it sprayed everywhere, so that's always a good sign, right? When you turn the water on for the first time, and it just sprays everywhere, so we got to get that fixed, but... Um, we, you know, water's a necessity. It reminded me of when, uh, when we moved, when, when my wife and I got married at age 19 and bought a double wide, put it on the family farm. And, uh, that was before city water had made it out Trace Creek. And so we had to drill a well and I was naive to what that entailed and what that would look like. And, and basically you had to just pay this redneck guy to come drill a well. And if, if there wasn't any water in the well, you still had to pay him. Isn't that a joke? Like, I was just like, well, but I could have to pay you and then I don't get any water. And, and so then my mom tells me you could get this witcher to come out. And I'd never heard of this. And they take, you guys know what this is? You take a, like a, a forked branch and you walk around and there's like some voodoo magic that, you know, turns the branch down. And so I didn't have the money to hire a, a voodoo uh, witch doctor. Um, so we just gambled and thankfully, you know, we found water. And uh, so, you know, emptied our savings so we could have water in our house. But, um, but what, what we're going to see in Genesis 26, by the way, that's where we are uh, today. Genesis 26, Isaac, the son of Abraham, begins to dig wells in the promised land. And it's really important. It's easy for us to kind of gloss over the digging of wells because it seems like this just really mundane thing that happens that's included in the narrative. Like, why do we care that they were digging wells? It seems like a normal thing. It's what you have to do. You have to have water where you live. But what this signifies is Isaac <clears throat> settling in and saying, I'm going to remain in the promised land regardless of what circumstances come at me. Uh, regardless of how difficult it gets, Isaac, when he digs these wells, um, is saying, I'm going to remain here. And so in chapter 26, Isaac and his servants uh, dig multiple wells. Four of them are listed and named. There are probably more wells that they dug to remain there. But I want to just begin by reading the accounts of, of those wells being dug. Um, I'm going to read the, pa the passage, really the whole chapter today, but a little bit out of order. Let's start at verse 18, if, if you have a Bible and you want to follow along with me. Genesis 26, verse 18. It says, Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them, and when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that also. So he called its name Setna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us. And we shall be fruitful in the land. Let's skip down a few verses and look at verses 32 and 33 for the fourth well that they dig. It says, uh, that same day Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that they had dug and said to him, we have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Now, these four wells that Isaac digs, uh, they, they all have meanings in the Hebrew names that are given to them. And um, and I, I've, I'm going to kind of formulaically go through the story of Isaac today with, with the themes of these wells. And so the four points of today's sermon are four Hebrew words. So you note takers, you're going to hate me. And I, I'm sorry, but not sorry. Um, but we'll just look at the, the meanings of these words. Essek means contention. Sitna means enmity. Rehoboth means room. And Sheba means oath or covenant. And so these, these kind of themes really present themselves as prevalent in Isaac's situation as he finds himself uh, really tested in his faith and, and really facing, is he going to follow in, in the sin of his father Abraham or in the righteousness of his father Abraham or kind of like split the difference and do a little bit of both? And you'll see that he doesn't live up perfectly to, to what the expectation is. And so the first one, Essek, means contention. And we'll see some contention arise in Isaac's life uh, between his flesh and his desire to do what seems like the safest bet, and also uh, the, the will of the Spirit of God in his life, uh, to remain where he is supposed to remain, and the contention of just a famine that comes upon him, circumstances that are outside of his control that he has to deal with. You see, much of our lives are characterized by circumstances that come flying at us that, that we, we didn't create, we didn't bring upon ourselves, but we have to respond to. 
Um, I, I think many of you saw a social media post I made this week about encountering a uh, Huntington man. He rivals Florida man for headlines, by the way. Huntington man twirling a rake like a ninja with an American flag do-rag on in the middle of Route 60 in Huntington. I'm on my Harley, and when I approach him, he's in the middle of the road. He swings it at me like he's Babe Ruth, like just like, like we're a medieval jousting or something trying to take me off my Harley. And, you know, stuff comes at you, and you're like, I did not anticipate anything close to that happening when I got up that morning, okay? Um, and, and many of us throughout life, hopefully it's not, you know, do-rag guy with a rake, but, but so many things come at us that, that we could have, we, we just had no idea it was coming. Right, I had a conversation with my mom about just being in the hospital recently, and had, you know, the night before, the, I had, I'd preached a marriage conference and preached a funeral and, and had no idea that the next morning I was going to have to call 911 and, and get in an ambulance. Like it, we have no idea what's coming at us, but when those things come at us, how we respond really reveals our character, reveals who we serve, who we worship, whether we worship our, um, our comfort or or whatever we've stored up to, to help us, or our own strategies and pragmatism, or whether we worship the Lord and we fall upon Him and His power. Now, so for most of us, when these circumstances come, they, they look like points of stress, um, contention, pressure, and they can all, always lead us into failure. But a lot of times what we don't think about is on the opposite end of that spectrum, uh, points of pleasure can leave, leave us away from God's will as well. Um, so, so trial and treasure can both be temptations for us. And what we'll see from Isaac in this chapter is he's faced with both. At the beginning of the chapter, he's in a famine. He's, he's literally faced with not knowing where his next meal will come from, not having the money to pay his bills, not having the food to put on the table for his wife, not having what he needs, just his basic needs. And then by the end of the chapter, he has so much. He's wealthier than anyone else around him. And trial and treasure can both be temptations that lead us away from God's will. It's why uh, Agur in uh, Proverbs 30 writes, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. You hear this prayer? Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. What a beautiful prayer for us, right? Give me neither poverty nor riches, ultimately, so that I can give God the most glory with my life. And a trial comes upon Isaac that brings contention into his life. When everything seems to be going okay, a famine shows up, like his father Abraham had encountered. And the question is, will he flee from the promised land that God had told him to stay in? In Genesis 26, verse 1, it tells us, kind of sets the scene. It says, there was a famine in the land. Besides the former famine, that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Now this entire chapter is going to heavily mirror things that have happened before. If you've been following along with us as we've been going chapter by chapter through the book of Genesis, you'll notice things that seem repetitious and very similar. Uh, you'll see like father, like son type motif going on with Abraham and his son Isaac. Now that Abraham has passed away, these circumstances come also to Isaac. Now some skeptics of the Bible will say that the Bible mistakenly repeats itself, that this encounter with Abimelech happens with Abraham as well as with Isaac. Um, if you love Jesus, which I hope you do, and if not, I'll try to convince you by the end of the day today uh, to love him. But Jesus uh, affirmed that Moses wrote Genesis. And so I would contend that uh, the book of Genesis, really the, fir the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch are written by one man, Moses. Um, but some would, skeptics would say that uh, Genesis was written by four different authors. And, and they do this because of different, uh, different literary styles and different repetitions that happen. And this is one of those chapters that looks a lot like repetition. But let me just submit to you this. It's not literary repetition. It's sovereign repetition. It's not that Moses is just like trying to repeat something creatively because he's like a good fiction writer. What's happening is God has sovereignly orchestrated almost the exact same circumstance to come to Isaac that came to Abraham. He's stepping into the same test as his father. God is teaching the son just like he taught the father and thereby teaching all of us who are sons of Abraham by faith that we can trust when God tells us to stay somewhere. And so he tells Isaac, don't go down to Egypt like your father did. If you remember chapter 12 of Genesis, 
When famine comes the first time for Abraham, he runs away from the promised land where God had told him to go, and he goes to Egypt. And and when he goes to Egypt, he gets scared, and he ends up giving away Sarah, his wife, to the king, Pharaoh. He also attempted to give Sarah away to this very man that Isaac encounters, Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. That's in Genesis chapter 20. And Abraham had no doubt taught Isaac through his mistakes and the things that he had learned, the importance of staying in the promised land. God had said, this is the land of your descendants. You're to remain here. He had heard it from his father, Abraham. Isaac had also now heard it from his heavenly father. God reiterates it, and he says, do not go to Egypt. I love that God anticipates the very temptation that was going to come from Isaac's flesh. The contention that we feel between our flesh and the spirit is very real, but you need to know that God knows what you're tempted with. And God is showing you through his word, do not fall to that temptation. It's not good nor healthy for you. He says, do not go down to Egypt. He continues in verse 3. Instead, sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. You see, when every single thing about Isaac's circumstance, the contention in his life was screaming at him, run and go, the Lord was saying, stay and be faithful. And when there is contention between the flesh and the spirit, the question we have to face ourselves is, will we follow the spirit? Will we follow the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and leads us in the righteous path? Notice how God convinces Isaac to stay where he ought to stay. What, is, what, what tactic does God use to convince Isaac that he needs to stay in the land of promise? He just repeats himself. He just repeats the covenant that he'd repeated over and over and over again to Abraham. You guys that have been coming week in and week out through this series have heard it so many times. You know the covenant that was made with Abraham. The land will be given to you, and I will multiply your descendants, as many as the stars in the heaven. In verse 3, he says, stay in this land. In verse 4, he says, I'm going to multiply your descendants and give them the land. In verse 5, he says, you should obey me like your father obeyed me. And for us... Our application as new covenant believers, under the blood of Jesus Christ, our covenant is not found in our, our physical address. Our covenant is found in the blood of Jesus Christ. The gospel is our covenant. And how God should convince us to honor his will and walk in his righteous path is remind us of the gospel. The gospel is Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. And this is why we remind you of this week after week after week. I've had kids ask me before, when are you going to stop preaching about Jesus dying on the cross? And I say, never. That's got to be the central point of every sermon I ever preach because it is the central point of my life. The gospel is the covenant that I need continually reminded of. The gospel, see, is both a saving message when we repent and become Christians, but also a sustaining message as we live as Christians. Many of us think about the gospel as just an experience that we had one time rather than nourishment that we need for our whole lives. Like, think about it this way. Uh, I watched a movie last night with Bella that came out in 2004, and, and I, was, I was cool with watching it because my memory's not great, and I'd completely forgotten the plot and what happened and the ending and all those things. But if, if, if we were to watch that movie every week, we wouldn't make it very many weeks before I'd be like, all right, I'm done watching it, Right? But I eat Qdoba all the time. I never get tired of that. Some of y'all go to restaurants, really nice restaurants, and just order chicken tenders every time. My wife was asking what we're going to have for small group recently, and I said spaghetti. And she says, you always want spaghetti at group. And I'm like, yeah, because it's fine to have spaghetti once a week. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, right? When I was a kid, I, we, used to, we used to rent movies. You remember that? You had to go to a store and get a VHS tape and put it in this thing called a VCR, kids. And... And every week, uh, my sisters would go ahead of me and hide the movie that I wanted to get. It was called Follow That Bird. It was a, it was a blockbuster film starring Big Bird of Sesame Street. And I wanted, to watch that. I wanted to watch that every single week, right? Well, they got tired of it. And then as I grew up, of course, I, I, grew, I grow tired of it too, although I could probably watch it once or twice today. But when it's entertainment, you will grow tired of it, right? But the gospel is not entertainment. 
It's not like a fireworks show. It's, it's more like nourishment. You know how, you know, you know the primary symbol that the Bible uses for the gospel is bread. Like you ever go to a meal and you're like, I can't believe we're having bread again. No, we love bread. Amen. Like I just go to Panera and get one of those giant baguettes and just gnaw on it while I'm driving down the road. Like bread's good. I don't get tired of that. And so when we begin to see the gospel as nourishment, then it, then it doesn't need the pizzazz and fireworks and entertainment, but rather it's just, I, I need that in my life. I need to walk with this nourishment. You see, we become Christians through the message of the gospel, but that same covenant message applies to every single circumstance of my life. The message that saved me is the message I need to get through this coming week. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in and you came in here with today, the message that you became a Christian under, Jesus died for you, was buried and rose from the dead, that's what will get you through this week, through this circumstance, wherever you find yourselves. It's how you have profitable relationships. It's how you raise your children in the Lord. It's how you work without killing your coworkers. It's all based in the gospel. And so when we encounter contention, we don't need to just laser focus on the problems around us. We need to laser focus on the promise of God above us, that he has come to save us. The second well was named Sitna, which means enmity, and it's kind of like an, an elevated word. So not only was there contention, but now there was hostility is kind of what it means. And so enmity comes when we, when we deal with contention and circumstances in an ungodly way. And Isaac, even though he passes one part of the test, he, he basically says, I'm going to stay in the promised land. I'm not going to go to Egypt. Uh, but he also decides to sin in the same way as his father. He fails in another crucial part as he commits the same sin that his dad did regarding uh, his wife. Look at verse 6. It tells us he doesn't go to Egypt. Verse 6 says, So Isaac settled in Gerar. And when the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister. Uh-oh. Does that sound familiar? Same thing his dad did. For he feared to say, My wife, thinking, lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. And when he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought, lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this that you have done to us? One of the people might have easily lain with your wife, and you could have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. The same thing happened with Abraham and Abimelech, and God, in Abraham's case, graciously spared Sarah uh, from Abimelech, um, violating her, and here he graciously spares uh, Rebekah from being sexually assaulted or any sort of infidelity coming within their marriage, even though Isaac was immensely irresponsible and sinful in this act. Abimelech's reputation, though, by their action, shows us that his reputation as a king put fear into men. This is what happens when fear takes over instead of walking in the commandments of God. The beauty of the power of the Holy Spirit is it, it, it allows us, for the first time ever, to actually overcome fear of man. We see it in the apostles. The apostles in Acts 5.29, Peter and the other apostles, they answer men that are trying to put them to death. They say, we must obey God rather than men. But for us, it's still easy for us to fall into the trap of fearing man and fearing circumstances around us rather than fearing God. And any time that we don't fall into the trap of doing this, we should credit it to God's presence in our lives through his Holy Spirit. For our depravity would always lead us continually into sin and damnation if it weren't for God's Spirit dwelling within us. In the 16th century, there was an English reformer named John Bradford who from his, his church was able to, it was fixed on a, on a street that was kind of a main street that they would lead criminals down uh, to the gallows when they were taken to be executed. And John Bradford lived a, a holy life, did a lot of humanitarian work, and, and was known for a lot of good things. He was actually nicknamed Holy Bradford. This guy was um, so upstanding in the community and known for good works. But this guy, Holy Bradford, would look as criminals march down the street to be hanged and executed, and he would say, but for the grace of God, there goes John Bradford. Um, I used to hear my preacher say this when I was growing up, but for the grace of God, there go I. I used to think it was in the Bible, but it just came from this reformer. And what, what Bradford understood was, were it not 
not just for the gospel changing his life at one point when he was a child, but the gospel sustaining him and keeping him on a righteous path, were it not for God's Spirit's presence in his soul that he would live just as a deplorable life of every person that deserved to be executed. And Isaac here, even though he's kind of the golden boy, right? He's kind of the golden boy that that is not making the same mistakes as his father up to this point. He's looking pretty good. Uh, You know, Abraham had that hiccup with Hagar and Ishmael and Keturah, another wife, and he had other children, and he sent them out of the country. A lot of things that, you know, you look at Abraham, you're just like, I don't know what God's doing with this guy. But Isaac had one wife, not many. He was the golden child in many respects, yet when faced with enough pressure, he crumbled. And it's the case with, with all of us. No matter, how, listen, you could be perfect today on your Bible reading plan. If you are, God bless you. You're one in a million, okay? Um, but let's just say you are. You're walking with the Lord and you're doing everything right. You are not exempt from the pressure of the world we live in that is covered with sin. You will fall eventually. You will fail and you will need God's grace. History will always repeat itself, and mankind will always be sinful until Jesus comes back to redeem us fully and finally. You know, I, um, when, I was, when I was becoming a parent for the first time, I remember my parents saying to me, when I would ask why, they'd tell me to do something, I'd say why, they would say because I said so. Every parent says that, right? But I was going to be different. I remember having a conversation with Amanda. We're going to explain to our kids the reasons for why we do Well, not anymore. We're just tired of them at this point in life. You want to know why? Because I said so. It's right. I'm just own it at this point. <laughs> and no matter how hard we try to not repeat the sins of the generation before, not that it's sinful to say that, right? Because I'm going to justify myself saying that. But no matter how hard we don't want to be like the generation before us, we'll, we'll continue in the same stuff. And the reason is, is because this world is not our home and, and we're just doomed to fall into that depravity, but understand that we're being redeemed out of it. Even Isaac and Rebekah were not able to escape even their own family bringing this enmity and strife in upon them. Look at verse 34 at the end of the chapter. Just this quick little note about their son Esau. When he was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. And look what they did, these, son, these daughters-in-law. They made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. So no matter how hard Isaac and Rebekah tried to escape the enmity and the sin and the difficulty of the world, it remained all around them. They couldn't escape it. And this tells us as Christians that that our only comfort as Christians come when we realize we're not going to be comfortable. Like that's that's incredibly freeing. But there is there is spiritual comfort when we finally admit I'm okay with not being physically comfortable in this life. God has not designed me to just kind of lay back and chill with my golden ticket to heaven. That I will accept the discomfort of the world because there is a spiritual comfort that trumps it and is over all of those things. And he finds it when he finds room in the promised land. So the third well is Rehoboth, which means room or space. And as is always the case, God blesses undeserving people. Even though Isaac had sinned, even though he was unrighteous and unworthy, he is going to be blessed by God and given room or space to live in a land that he doesn't have the deed to. Now, a common question I get through counseling and pastoring uh, over several years is, is this question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, that's never happened except one time, and that's when Jesus was murdered on a cross. He's the only good people. All of us are, are sinfully and wicked and depraved. Our hearts are deceitful above all other things. And so bad things happen because we are bad people. That's just the reality of it. The question we should ask is why do good things happen to bad people like us? Why does God choose to bless bad people, sinful people like us? Well, because God is gracious and kind and patient. And even in the midst of Isaac's failure, we see a beautiful example of God's grace. On the heels of Isaac's failure, he is blessed immensely. And I want you this morning to just look at your own life and look at your blessings. Look at your family or the vehicle you drive or the house you have or the money in your bank account. And I know it could be more. I know your car could be nicer. I know all of those things are true, but I promise you that God has blessed you. And as you look at your life and your blessings, let me tell you this morning, you're not blessed because you're good. You're blessed because you're sovereignly chosen. And if you make the mistake of beginning to think that you're blessed because you're good, you'll start to live by karma instead of living by the gospel. That's not what the Bible preaches. That's not the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus isn't be good and I'll be good to you. The message of Jesus is you're undeserving, but I'm still good to you, so worship me. 
Isaac wasn't blessed for being the golden boy. He was sovereignly chosen by God, and God poured out undeserved blessings upon him. Look at verse 12. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed them, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. What is beautiful about this is the very thing that Isaac feared the most, King Abimelech and all of his strength, the very thing that Isaac was afraid of comes to him and says, you're stronger than we are. Isaac's wealth and power had surpassed the very thing that he was afraid of. And this is what the life-changing power of the gospel does to us, right? You are too weak to stand against the circumstances you're up against. You don't have enough money to overcome them. You don't have enough courage to stand up to them. You don't have enough strength to resist the temptations of sin in your life. The things against you are stronger than you, but they're not stronger than your Savior. Let me remind you what 1 John 4, 4 says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You see, you're not an overcomer on your own, but you worship an overcomer who makes you one. Fear is, is, is something that gripped Isaac, but it was a good and necessary emotion to teach him something because fear didn't stop Isaac from faithfulness. Psalm 27 verse 1 tells us, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And so the next time that you are fearful about your circumstances, you might be in that place today. When fear grips you, you should say, Herein lies an opportunity for God to get a lot of glory. Because I'm too scared to do this on my own. I'm too weak to do this on my own. And if this happens, it will only be by God's grace. Isaac, in a a fearful way, but yet in a faithful way, said, you know what? We're going to stay right here. In the land of potential enemies, we're going to stay right here. In a land of famine without wealth, we're going to stay right here. And to prove we're going to stay here, we're going to start digging wells. And even when contention and enmity comes from digging those wells, Essek and Sitna. Eventually, you get to Rehoboth, which means I'm going to find room in God's plan. And I'm going to stay where God wants me to stay. And in the midst of enemies and danger, God had granted Isaac room to live permanently. Let me just ask you this morning, what if God has given you room in the most uncomfortable of places? What if you have angst about where you live or the neighborhood you're in? and You just, you just want to get out. What if, God's, what if God's given you room there? What if God sovereignly placed you there? What if you hate your job, but God has given you room there for the people there, an opportunity there? And and what would it look like for our entire local church to say, even when it's most uncomfortable, where we perceive and feel that God has given us room and territory, we're going to step into that, where there's an inch for us to get a foot in the door. We're going to pray that the gospel permeates throughout our region and our individual spheres of influence because Christianity should permeate communities. You know, we're getting ready to move into a bigger building. You guys are going to have to worship with the 9 a.m. crowd. They're weird. They get up early. They, like, they're on time. Like, y'all aren't. You, you know. I get it, right? And we're all going to be in, in one room at the same time. And it's going to be tempting to just be like, yeah, I'm just, a, I'm just lost in a, a sea of faces. This church is big, and, and, and I don't know what's going on. But what would it look like for us to just say, God, we know that you know us personally, and we want to be on board with whatever you would have us to do. That whatever mission you have in front of us, whoever you would have us to bring along into this church family, that even if it's something as crazy as getting in a bigger building and having to go back to two services, Lord, we will bring people to know you because you are worth it, God. What would that look like? Well, I know that's dangerous, but that's my prayer for you, church. That we would submit our lives to God so fully that even when it's terrifying and full of fear, that we would say, Lord, we have enough faith to follow you. The last well that's dug was named Sheba, which means oath or covenant. This last well was named because of a treaty with King Abimelech, named, named Oath. Abimelech comes to Isaac, and he had already made a treaty with his father Abraham, but here he kind of continues it with Isaac. In verse 28, they said to Isaac, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. 
So we said, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. And so he makes this oath or this treaty, and when they find water in this place, they name it after this recent oath that had been made between Abimelech and Isaac. The first application that we see here is that they saw plainly that God's hand of blessing was upon Isaac. And I want to ask you today, do do people around you see that God is in your life? Is it evident to the people around you? The people around you should see God's blessing upon you. Now, don't mishear me. That doesn't mean that you drive the nicest car and have all the best stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. But God's blessing should be found in your demeanor, your character, your attitude, sometimes maybe just the contentment with the lack of stuff that you have. And Abimelech saw God's hand on Isaac and desired an oath or a covenant of peace and sought it out. And so what's important here is that Isaac received horizontal or relational peace because he had vertical peace with his relationship with God. Some of you, some of you wonder why you have so much drama in your life. Why you have so much contention and enmity and strife and quarreling with with your spouse, you fight every week, or with your coworkers, you don't get along, or with with your family, you just can't get it together, or your friends are always changing and having grudges against one another. Some of you are wondering why that stuff happens when your relationship with God is just awful. There's a lack of devotion, there's a lack of commitment. And the reality is if, if if we don't devote ourselves to God, pray. Read our scriptures, worship him, give financially to him, serve him with our time and effort. If we don't do that, then how in the world would we expect our relational commitments to be halfway decent? You see, what happened before the horizontal relationship with Abimelech and the people that Isaac was afraid of got right was he spoke with the Lord and he had a good relationship with the Lord. Even after his sin, he had a good relationship with God. In verse 24, it says, The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. And so Isaac is told by God, the promise still stands. The covenant is still here. I'm going to bless you. Do not be afraid. Isaac, how will you respond? Verse 25 tells us what he did. He built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. So the relationships around him were filled with peace only when Isaac was at peace with God. Only when Isaac had faith to walk in a way that was filled with grace, not because he had it all together and was the golden boy, but because God had just blessed him freely. That as a response to that, because of God's sovereign plan, as a response to that, Isaac said, I'm going to, I'm going to, in faith, put my tent up here. I'm not going anywhere. And we're going to dig more wells. They're saying we will stay in God's plan. And I want to, I want to close by asking you today, look in your life and, and what areas of your life do you need to, do you need to seek gospel permanency, gospel mission? What, what wells do you need to be digging? It's going to require you picking up the shovel and doing some work. It's going to require you to open your mouth and speak to people. That's a very fearful act for you. But you need to invite people along into the family of God, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, walking in devotion to Jesus himself, worshiping him with all that you are, standing in the face of fearful circumstances and saying, I trust God more than I fear my circumstances. It's going to take faith and work, but the promises of God are irrevocable. And he has already promised his great covenant to us through the death of Jesus on the cross. Nothing can touch you. You are safe. Maybe not physically. Maybe circumstances are going to fall apart around you. But spiritually, you are invincible if you're a child of God. And if you're here and you have not accepted that yet, what on earth are you waiting for? Can I just beg you to submit your life to the one who knows all things and is powerful over all circumstances? It's not going to make everything gravy for you, but it will spiritually speaking. And no matter what comes at you in this life, you have a promise of eternity that will never, never be squandered away.